Great, another video about Dune. I bet it's so original and makes points no one has ever heard before. Fair point there, hypothetical commenter. None of my discussion of scientific theories here will be new information to those who are extremely familiar with the past two decades of scholarship on religious psychology, nor will my praise of Dune's depiction of religion surprise those familiar with the story. I'm betting, though, that the overlap between these two groups of people is small enough that most of you will find this video original enough to leave me a like. If by the end you don't, go ahead and comment, may thy YouTube career chip and shatter, and I'll accept it. Also, since any kind of engagement helps, it's kind of a win for me either way. So, yes, religion in Dune is good. And since Dune Part 2 is still fresh in all of our minds, I'll focus my commentary on this film. Spoilers, by the way. When I saw the scene where Stilgar explains the sacred pools from which no Fremen would ever drink, I was basically screaming, that's totally in line with Richard Sosa's costly signaling theory, this is amazing! But since Alamo Drafthouse Cinema apparently has a no-tolerance policy for sharing even insightful commentary like mine, this went completely unappreciated and my wife was pissed the whole ride home. About this scene. Stilgar explains that when a Fremen dies, the water in their body is removed and put into one of the Fremen's pools of the dead underground. Not even a Fremen dying of thirst would drink this water, he tells Lady Jessica. It's sacred. There are supposedly thousands of these pools, and on a planet where the people won't even cry to mourn their dead because it's a waste of water, having a taboo against using these millions of gallons seems like a colossal waste. But from a sociological perspective, it's absolutely brilliant. In a study of 19th century communes, Anthropologist Richard Sosis found that religious communes endured far better than secular communes. After analyzing every factor he could, Sosis found that one variable coincided with a community's longevity more than any other, the number of costly sacrifices a commune demanded from its members. This included things like fasting, abstinence from alcohol, tobacco, and certain foods, conforming to a dress code or cutting off relationships with outsiders. The more sacrifices a commune demanded, the longer it lasted. Upholding an extreme taboo against drinking from this massive supply of water demands an extraordinary sacrifice from every Fremen, one which they're reminded of nearly every day in their sieges. In this way, Fremen culture makes an ingenious trade-off. One precious resource, water, is traded for one even more valuable, the coherence and longevity of their very social order. Fremen society is pretty remarkable. It's egalitarian, relatively free of internal conflict, extremely resilient, and capable of overpowering the Harkonnen, a group with vastly greater resources. This is, I think, due in large part to their brilliant system of religious rituals and taboos. To me, this is the true source of so-called desert power. <laughs> Richard Sosis found that secular communes which demanded costly sacrifices didn't see the same effect on their longevity that religious communes did. He argued that this is because religious communes could sacralize their demands. As Rappaport stated, to invest social conventions with sanctity is to hide their arbitrariness in a cloak of seeming necessity. Sanctified rituals define what it is to be human for the believer, Although secular rituals can generate a sense of community and obligation toward group members, their performers perceive them as capricious. This brings me to Chani and the perspective she voices about the Fremen's religious views, especially the prophecy. She fights for the well-being of her people, not because of any religious edict, and she states the reasonable opinion that belief in the prophecy keeps the Fremen complacent in their oppression, just waiting around for their messiah. I, and I'm sure most viewers, sympathized with her perspective, while also finding the way her thoughts fell on deaf ears to be painfully realistic. So, why can't the secular Fremen gain the social power of the religious? Chani's secular motivations, according to Sosis, could not demand unquestioning adherence, thus reinforcing social custom and cohesion, as well as religious ideology. 
By directing ritual's reference toward the unfalsifiable, religions attach themselves to ultimate beliefs that are unverifiable and hence potentially eternally true. These ultimate sacred postulates are not subject to the vicissitudes of examination. They are beyond examination, making them much stabler reference than those employed by secular rituals. We saw just how unfalsifiable Stilgar's religious views were several times, especially when he took Paul's denial of being the Mahdi as even further confirmation that he was. I'm not the Messiah, will you please listen? I am not the Messiah, do you understand? Honestly! Only the true Messiah denies his divinity! What? Well, what sort of justice does that give me? All right, I am the Messiah! It's no wonder then, from an informed perspective, that the religious ultimately directed the Fremen's actions in both waiting for the Mahdi and fighting alongside Paul. Now, let's talk about the fundamentalists in the South. It's said in the film that nothing can survive down there without faith. This association between inhospitable environments and increased levels of religious fervor is accurate to what we observe in the real world. Natural disasters are known to increase religiosity in those who experience them. In 2011, an earthquake struck Christchurch, New Zealand, killing over 130 people and injuring hundreds more. A longitudinal study was conducted on the population of the country, and researchers found that there was a significant upturn in religious faith among those who experienced the misery of New Zealand's most lethal natural disaster in 80 years. Further, in their research on war-torn communities in Uganda, Tajikistan, and Sierra Leone, a team of anthropologists led by Joseph Henrik found that people exposed to violent conflict were more likely to attend religious services and participate in religious rituals. Why is this? It seems that religious ritual can help reduce anxiety in unstable or hostile environments. In a study of women impacted by the 2006 Lebanon War, our friend Richard Sosis and his co-author, W. Penn Handworker, found that women who regularly recited psalms experienced lower rates of anxiety than those who didn't. And the closer they were to the conflict, the more the ritual reduced anxiety. Undoubtedly, the Fremen in the South face existential threats on a daily basis, given that the place is so uninhabitable that the Harkonnen didn't even think to look for them there. This drives them to cling tightly to their religious beliefs and customs, which help them manage the nearly impossible task of surviving in the southern hemisphere of Arrakis. Dune gets it right then, that it's only certain people in the North, in relatively less hostile environments, that get by on their belief in Fremen, rather than on the intense religious ritualization of everyday life. Another thing it gets right? Religious fundamentalism can motivate support for war. In Dune, it's basically a given that the Southern fundamentalists will go to war by the millions if the Mahdi shows up to lead them. Accordingly, research has found that among Americans, religious fundamentalism was associated with greater support for extreme military interventions. At this point, some of you might have noticed the potential for a vicious cycle here. The hardship of war can motivate religious fervor, and religious fervor can motivate support for war. Joseph Henrik suggests that through this relationship between religion and conflict, there stands the possibility for feedback loops to develop. One thing that's interesting to think about is I think there's other evidence to suggest that religions make people more cooperative, make them bond better as a group, lead to greater solidarity. So uh, one possibility is that there have been historical feedbacks where religion led to a group, say, spreading, widely diffusing, and then the experience of war made them more religious. And so you can imagine you get some kind of feedback loop there. There could be various ways in which religion causes uh, warfare. One would be that it, it makes people more religious, more cooperative, more parochial, um, more tightly bound as a group, and then that group is able to uh, force its will or it believes it'll be more successful in conflict with other groups. So, in the next Dune film, will we see this feedback loop in action? If the holy war Paul foresees does come about, we just might. It depends on how the story is adapted for the screen, but 
I think there's a good chance the next film will depict religious psychology just as accurately as Dune Part 2. Finally, we've got to talk about the film's incredible depiction of what Joseph Henrik calls Credibility Enhancing Displays, or CREDS for short. This is another theory that revolves around costly religious behaviors. Toward the end of the film, Princess Irulan and Emperor Shaddam talk about how to deal with the uprising of the Fremen. Princess Irulan says, If this Muad'Dib is a religious figure, you can't use direct force. Repression only makes religion flourish. You'll only end up humiliating yourself. Prophets get stronger when they die. Now, anyone familiar with the countless Christian and Muslim martyrs know that last statement to be true. But why is that? According to Henrik's theory of creds, engaging in costly behaviors for the sake of your religion influences those in observation to see your religious ideals as credible. After all, if you're willing to sacrifice for a belief, there must be something to that belief. So if your religion requires, say, uh, religious leaders, priests, whatever the, whatever the relevant category is, to engage in costly displays, this could be um, food taboos, vows of poverty, um, sacrifice, walking on hot coals. So there's a whole uh, wide array of these things that you see across the world in different religions. That makes them a more effective transmitter. Because when you see someone engage in one of these costly things like celibacy, that doesn't seem like something someone would do unless they really believe the underlying supernatural beliefs. I mean, if you look at uh, the role of martyrdom in religions, um, so you know, Jesus or uh, the early Christian martyrs martyr themselves and they're willing to die for their beliefs, that's persuasive to a learner that this person really believed in heaven or whatever they were, whatever they were preaching. So martyrdom essentially being the ultimate yeah, credibility the ultimate enhancing cred. display. It's yeah, the, the ultimate, ultimate cred. cred. Interesting. There is empirical support for this theory, by the way. Henrik and his team have found that individuals who were exposed to high levels of religious creds by their caregivers were especially likely to report currently believing in the existence of God with high certainty. Conversely, those exposed to especially low levels of religious creds were most likely to currently report a lack of belief in God with high certainty. They also found that verbal expressions of religious belief and prodding of one's children to believe have limited efficacy in the absence of creds. So, Princess Irulan was right that prophets get stronger when they die, as their death functions as the strongest possible cred for their belief system. Still though, Paul was able to use creds, both intentionally and unintentionally, to shore up the Fremen's belief in him without becoming a martyr. Paul fights alongside the Fremen, constantly risking his life for their cause. This earns him a place among the Fedaikin, but also, even though Paul does not mean for this to reinforce anyone's belief in his place in the prophecy, it absolutely does. Certain believers become even more confident that Paul knows on some level that he is the Lisan al-Gaib. That is creds in action. After Paul drinks the water of life, though, he seems to purposely use creds to his advantage. He gains enough prescience to know that fighting the emperor's champion, Fade Rafa, will injure but not kill him. Others don't know this, though. Fighting Fade seems like a massive risk to everyone else, except maybe Lady Jessica. It appears that Paul is willing to die for his belief in the prophecy and his place in it. This is very nearly what Henrik calls the ultimate cred. So, by fighting Fade, Paul massively boosts others' faith in the prophecy and in him all without actually paying the full price of this costly display. Okay, let me tell you why I think it's so remarkable that this story gets so much right about the psychology of religion. All of the research I cited in this video was done within the last 30 years, and much of it within the last 15. Frank Herbert published Dune in 1965, Herbert was an experienced journalist and apparently learned a good deal from two psychologist friends of his in the 1950s, but to write something this in line with psychological and anthropological theories that would only be devised decades later is just astounding. So, let me know what you think. Was this enough of an original take on Dune to be worth watching? Is there anything I missed? Is there anything you think Dune gets wrong about the psychology of religion? 
I look forward to reading your comments. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support. If you want to hear more from me, then subscribe. As always, if you are an apostate in need, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.